So then we start. Welcome to the third webinar and um, also uh, sadly the last webinar of our series with uh, OER in North European countries, not in a whole, not all very in the North, uh, because some of us met from Finland, Norway, uh, Sweden and, and, and Germany. Um, and so we had also two very, uh, very um, international uh, webinars with uh, highlighting projects and, um, and, and current states in, uh, in our countries. And this time we uh, take the time to discuss the UNESCO recommendation that was published uh, last week or two weeks before? Monday last week. On Monday last week, yeah. so um, <clears throat> we we take the chance to discuss it for our countries and what uh, the uh, can bring. And I'm um, uh, maybe maybe I should introduce uh, the people who are uh, part of the webinar organization team. Uh, we have uh, Ilmarie in from Finland, Jörg from uh, Sweden. We have uh, Anna from Finland too. And now I hope I do not miss someone. Kerstin from, from Germany and Gabi also from Germany. Um, we have also uh, uh, Christoph, yes, who is supporting us um, with, the, with the technical parts. And as a special, special guest and the first uh, one who will um, give us a little input is Paul Stacy, who is was part of the team that um, that um, formulates and creates and, and finalizes the, um, uh, the, the UNESCO recommendation for OER. Buddy, thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. So, uh, so, so maybe you can start. I, 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 all, I only know that you are still in, in, in Milano, <laughs> where, where we have, where we have you uh, been last, uh, last in, and you are from Vancouver. So, sure. I'm sure, so I'll jump in and, and provide maybe a bit of a, an introduction to the OER recommendation and some of its, some of the background context on how it got created and then also talk about what it says, which is the most important part probably, and then some ideas and recommendations or suggestions for um, where do we go from here now that it's been adopted, uh, formally adopted just last week. I prepared a few slides, so let me do some sharing of the screen so that I can kind of provide some of that. But if you're interested in actually accessing the document itself, I've dropped a link in to the document into the chat area of Zoom, as well as a link to the news that UNESCO released last week um, announcing that um, adoption. So that's also worth checking out. Um, but yeah, let me just do screen sharing. You can see this, yeah? Is it okay? Yeah. All right, good. Thanks. Um, so yeah, so just um, a little bit about me. I, I'm Paul Stacy. I'm the executive director of uh, an organization called Open Education Global. And as has been said, I'm here in Milano where we just did our annual global conference on open education. And we also announced the change of our name. So actually, if you go to that website URL, you'll see something called the Open Education Consortium, um, but we're migrating our name and our identity to Open Education Global. And if you don't know of us, um, here's a little bit about who we are. Uh, we're essentially a nonprofit global organization that has members all around the world. So we've got over 240 members from over 44 countries. They're made up of organizations and institutions and schools and NGOs and IGOs that all are engaged in open education in some way. And of course, we're always uh, welcoming new members. And these are the kind of things we do. We did our conference, um, but we also give out open education awards. We do open education week, which is in March this coming year. And I hope uh, that provides a, a format or in a forum for you to talk about open education initiatives in your own countries. And then we run some regional nodes, one in the US currently uh, for community colleges and another one in Latin America that involves nine different countries. Um, and then we do special projects and help our members interact and collaborate with each other around partnering, professional development, policy and strategy and communication. So that's a little bit about who we are. Um, but really we're here to talk about the actual UNESCO OER recommendation. And um, 
and what I thought, so, so this is a pretty major historical milestone in my view for open education. And I think it's worth unpacking um, a little bit about uh, how we got here and what it means to now have this recommendation. So I thought I'd do a little bit of that just to set the, set the context and, and perhaps provide some, some um, discussion items that you might uh, talk about in your breakout groups. Uh, but UNESCO has uh, three different types of instruments that they that they uh, develop and pass or adopt as a as a collective. Um, norm, the, there's conventions, recommendations, and declarations. Uh, but really, for the most part, the recommendations and declarations are the most common. Um, and a recommendation, which is what we have now, um, it provides member states with defined actions that are recommended that they pursue for certain areas. And it calls on those member states to report out on those actions on, on a regular basis, which, which gets defined in the, uh, the general conference where the recommendation is adopted. I haven't heard exactly what the reporting period will be, but in the previous discussions leading up to it, it was roughly three years. So every three years, member states will be called upon to report out on what they've done to make progress against the recommendation. Um, and the recommendation um, gets adopted at the general conference and they rely on consensus. So it's not a matter of voting, it's a matter of everyone agreeing to do it. And so 193 member states uh, essentially agreed to do this from around the world. Um, it's sort of a two-step procedure and um, some of you, um, I, I, so I have been participating at various stages in the development of this recommendation. Um, I, it's interesting that this recommendation, um, in addition to the two-step procedure that you see outlined here that happens at, um, at UNESCO itself, they actually opened up the early draft versions of the recommendation for community input. And uh, so it was like a giant Google document on which anyone could add either comments or edit re edited revisions or recommendations for new things that should be added. So, uh, so for example, I, I added some substantive material to one of the five action areas that got approved and adopted. And so it's like, wow, <laughs> it's kind of fun to have the opportunity as just a normal person, not an actual um, representative of Canada in any way, but as a, a kind of, um, you know, a society to, uh, to have some input into the recommendation. So that was qu quite an amazing process. But um, earlier this year, I also was at UNESCO for the, um, for the consensus building around the draft of the recommendation. And at that, that was like a two day long intensive process where every sentence, every word of the recommendation, which is a lot of pages long, got presented to the representatives of member states and they all got to discuss it and challenge it or suggest changes that, that would be necessary for them to consider adopting it. And the amazing thing is that after two days, there was a complete consensus among all of the participating member states to um, with for the draft recommendation, and then as we as we heard last week, it now has gone to the whole general conference, which is a big annual event that UNESCO holds, and has been now approved and adopted. So it's a very public and transparent process. Um, I think it's worth noting, though, that there's like it's been a long process. <laughs> you know, we can go way back, and and actually the. The actual document re references some of these historical things that have happened in the past. So I think the big reference points will be, and these are also worth checking out, the Cape Town Open De Education Declaration from 2007. Um, in 2012, UNESCO adopted a declaration, which is less binding than the recommendation that they just adopted. So the declaration has no monitoring or reporting requirements. It just is a, is a declaration that there's um, support for open education. But in 2016, 2017, there was an effort made to try to move beyond just the declaration to a formal recommendation. And so that happened. Um, and out of that came some, came this whole process. It basically started in 2016, going all the way through to 2019. And if you, and those of you that were at our conference here in Milano 
heard some representatives from UNESCO talking about how rigorous this process was and how intensive it is because it requires lots of lobbying, lots of meetings, lots of convenings to kind of build global consensus around such a formal instrument. I won't go through all these stages, but you can see that the process itself is, is pretty rigorous and took years of work, lots and lots of people, eight drafts, et cetera, et cetera, you can see. It's, it's a huge, long process. And, and I mean, I would say, my experience of it, of course, is when you're, it's kind of bureaucratic, um, but I love the notion that it's consensus-based, and I also really appreciated that it was done in an open, transparent manner that allowed the open education community to have a say. Uh, that was really special. Um, and so let's jump to the chase now and just talk about what it says. So I actually have the document here with me, um, but I decided not to put a lot of details on these slides, but to encourage you to actually read the document because it's, it's, um, it's quite a few pages long and, and there's lots of substantive recommend, you know, recommendation um, information in the document, but let me highlight the main things that it has. It does have a set of aims and objectives which are worth reading, but the, the heart of it really is the five main action areas that are in the recommendation. So let me just touch on those um, so that we have kind of a common understanding of them all. And I'm, I'm going to look at the document, maybe highlight a few things from it while you're looking at the slide, but the five things are there around the circle. Um, so the first action area is building capacity. Um, it has to do with helping stakeholders create, access, reuse, adapt, and redistribute open education resources, which, which is a really big action area. And so that goes, goes into a lot of um, details around how member states are encouraged to do that, um, which would include things like building awareness, um, providing systematic capacity building um, on how to create and access and make use of open education resources. Um, it would also include making people aware of the, uh, the limitations associated with copyright, as well as the ways in which open licenses, such as Creative Commons, enable people to create resources that then become shareable. And it also um, talks about um, uh, building the ne necessity to build digital literacy skills associated with being able to do any of those things that are in that first action area. So that's the first one. And by the way, should I be checking chat? Someone jump in and tell me if I, or maybe why don't I finish this? This won't take long. I'll finish this and then we can talk and have questions. Um, the second action area is around developing supportive policy. Uh, so it's a little bit different than the way it looks here in, in this circle. Um, and so member states are encouraged to develop and implement policy, either nationally, regionally, or even at an institutional level. And, uh, and so that requires um, thinking about policy in terms of communities of practice, in terms of uh, developing teachers from a professional development perspective on how to make use of open education resources and develop them themselves. It also includes uh, helping people through policy uh, understand the importance of open file formats in terms of creating these open education resources. And also uh, it, it makes some recommendations around the potential use of policy related to open education resources in the context of transforming education because most commonly policy rarely is sort of specifically about open education and more about uh, say the use of digital technologies to transform education. It also has a recommendation in it in the policy section around um, encouraging and supporting research on open education resources. Um, so that's uh, that's another action area, the second action area around supporting supportive policy. A third one is around uh, the importance of encouraging effective and inclusive and equitable access to quality open education resources. And I think this is, this is in recognition of part of the whole aim and objective of this recommendation is to, is to broaden access to education and include those who have been wanting access but have had limited access because of um, money, lack of um, prior skill development and so on. And, and as we all know, 
uh, open education in general is around eliminating those barriers and making it available to all. So, so the, the sub points in this um, action area have to do with, um, with acknowledging cultural and linguistic differences, gender differences, um, of the importance of uh, language and having open education resources in uh, a local language, including indigenous languages, uh, looking at um, universal access and those who are less well able and trying to ensure that open education and open education resources are available to them. Um, and also looking at uh, trying to ensure that public investments in things like ICT infrastructure and um, and technologies are, um, are used to promote the access to open education resources, particularly in low income, rural and, and urban communities. Um, and then it's, there's also a section here around creating some evidence-based standards and benchmarks that would be used related to the quality assurance of open education resources, which I think is always a, um, a hot topic. How do we know that open education resources are high quality? And, and there's a definite need to, um, to work on that and define some categories and benchmarks that are going to ensure that's the case. Um, so then the next action area is around nurturing the creation of sustainable models for open education resources. And this is an actual uh, action area that I contributed uh, perhaps the most to because I wrote a book on open business models when I worked at Creative Commons uh, called Made with Creative Commons, free download. <laughs> um, but the whole thing here is how do we ensure that the uh, development and use of open education resources is sustainable and is funded over time. Lots and lots of open education work has been done based on project-based funding, one-time little grants that you get to, to start up something. But the actual investments to sustain and iterate and manage and further develop that resource over time is something that uh, really is a, a critical action area if we want to see um, these initiatives sustain over time and simply not stop when a grant fund ends. So that um, this recommendation starts looking at how do you think about or rethink about the procurement processes that you might be using for education and make use of existing funds in different ways as opposed to just kind of maintaining status quo. It looks at uh, also non-traditional funding sources. So uh, how, can, how can we think about um, attracting the necessary funding necessary to do this um, through non-traditional means? It also talks about the importance in this area of thinking about sustainability in ways that go beyond money. Uh, this is actually a really important one from my point of view. So it has to do with how do we think about things like attribution and recognition of people who are creating open education resources and ensure that their willingness to do so is promoted and continued from a motivation point of view through things that aren't just financial. Um, it also looks at um, um, providing a mechanism or a system for people to provide feedback on open education resources, recommendations, let's say for enhancement, and even means by which people can actually participate in that process. So, so personally speaking, I actually think this is a really fascinating um, area because in my view, we've focused really heavily so far on open education resources as forms of content and as a kind of legal construct around using open licenses and to some extent as a technical thing that we can kind of use to distribute. But we actually haven't paid very much attention at all to the whole social process of how open education and open education resources are developed. The pedagogy and teaching aspects of open education, I think, are starting to happen but are still very much in their infancy and I think we also need to pay attention to things like um, the stewardship of open education across time not as a technology but as a social process there's lots of stuff in here about that and then um, the fifth um, action area has to do with promoting and um, reinforcing international cooperation around this which I think is a really awesome, uh, this is a really important thing because 
There's lots of national or regional open education initiatives, but rarely have we seen a lot of cooperation and collaboration that goes beyond a national boundary. And that's sometimes because, you know, taxpayer or national public money is being used to fund an open education initiative. And, and there isn't a lot of appetite or thought about what's the larger potential of this from a multinational or global perspective. And that's kind of where, where my organization is coming in. Um, so yeah, there's a bunch of things, a lot of really great recommendations there. And then as you can see on this slide, so I recommend you read the details in the document. And then on the slide, you can see that there's also another section that deals with monitoring and reporting. And so, as I said earlier, the recommendation is a more binding document than the, the declaration, the previous declaration. And so there's um, some recommendations in, the, in this document itself about how states should think about monitoring their progress to, uh, of implementing the OER recommendation and what to expect around uh, reporting out against what the recommendation calls for. I think I've kind of highlighted research here again. I do think that we need to, of course, continue to build up the evidence base on why open education and open education resources are important and effective. And that that, that research base is, becomes critical as we're trying to reach and convince those who are in senior positions who have decision-making authority or budget-making budget authority or even uh, the responsibility of setting policy. Of course, they want to do all those things based on evidence that this is going to work and be effective. And so I think that's a really important piece. So that's, I know this a long ramble <laughs> from me. Thanks for listening. But those are the five main things inside this document. And, and to be honest, I think that they're good. I actually, you know, I've been working in this field since 2003 now. Oh my gosh, how did that happen? Um, but when I reflect back on um, what are the key sort of main topics that we might be asking people to focus on, these seem uh, really quite good. So now what? So um, I, I guess where I'm at with this is that there are sometimes things that UNESCO generates that end up just sitting there and not really being adopted. Um, but I do think that this is an awesome opportunity to begin to uh, talk to gov our governments around implementation and what they're going to do toward making progress against this recommendation. Um, I think that we need to help our governments develop some metrics and indicators around what progress might look like. I think that there's an opportunity for a lot of collaboration and uh, cooperation globally to support each other in this process. And, uh, and it's worth noting that, um, that, well, first of all, that UNESCO itself has announced a dynamic coalition that will largely be made up of government bodies to help with the adoption and implementation of the recommendation. But then my own organization, uh, Open Education Global, in, in the background over the last couple of months, thinking or hoping that this would be formally adopted, has been building a coalition of organizations, what I think of as sister organizations, to help with implementation and adoption of the recommendation. So our initial partners there's us, but there's also Creative Commons and Spark and all the other uh, uh, sister organizations that you see listed there. In my view, those are just the starting ones that I happen to have a, a good relationship with and a, a kind of established rapport with. But I think we also need to build out further support for regions for which these, potential, these particular organizations may not have the reach and impact. Um, for example, Africa, parts of Africa and parts of Asia. I think need to be beefed up in terms of who the sister organizations are here. Um, all right, I'm going to stop sharing. <laughs> and um, well, yeah, so that's kind of uh, my piece. I hope that's helpful. Um, but I welcome some any questions right now. But I also am in cognizant of the need and importance of having breakout group time to talk about some of these things. So I'll turn it back over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. Um, just to, to mention, uh, there were two things in the chat. One was uh, Jörg, who, uh, uh, who put the links to the, to the documents there. And the second was me, who uh, 
hopefully found the right book you, you <laughs> talked about. So uh, that's that is the right one. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So uh, uh, maybe for some links for uh, people later on. I also hope very well that it will not be yet another document on the UNESCO website. And uh, I think we have uh, good chances because as I read it today, I read the German version. Therefore, uh, you already have a, we already have a German version. I don't know if this has already happened in, in Sweden and Finland. And um, I found some, some points that we have already started in Germany. We could uh, set up and then most most important there are points we can we can show our our politicians and our um, our policy makers and say the UNESCO recommends it let's do it <laughs> yes yeah. so and the further plan for this webinar is that we will be split or, um, off into uh, three groups I I, I guess uh, and uh, Jörg knows how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to hand over to you. <laughs> yes, I, I know how to do it when it's a <laughs> webinar, uh, when it's a meeting. I don't know if this link is now a <laughs> meeting because I don't see the breakout rooms button at my menu list, at least. But uh, while we're figuring this out, but is there anyone who has it? Uh, I mean, it's not often you get the chance to have a direct question to Paul Stacy, which is <laughs> very accessible, uh, but... Uh, was there anything direct? Because there might be one before we... Yeah, happy, please. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Kirsten from Hamburg. Hi, Kirsten. And um, I'm interested in the question about the further steps, about monitoring and a little bit about research. What about waiting two years and looking for the politician politicians' activities? Uh, what are the the um, uh, the possibilities to uh, make the uh, recommend recommendation um, make uh, yes make a point in two or five years, or are there a chance to um, to have some um, um, sorry about. Um, some some points to uh, to do um, how to say um, how to make it happens reco re recommendation so <laughs> from yes. yeah well here's how I think of it um, well I should say a couple of things I guess before I say what I think should happen uh, the first one is that although this is a recommendation um, it's not as if it's a mandate. So no government is being told you have to do this. Mm -hmm. This is still a recommendation. And so it's still at the, at the option or choice of each government, each member state as to whether they uh, want to do the recommendations um, in the action areas uh, that are called for. Um, the, in my view, the stakeholders, the ones for who this is a call to action are primarily ministries of education, but not exclusively. And so I would, my expectation will be that, um, that member states would be now looking for their ministries of education, both primary and secondary, as well as higher education, if those are the same ministry grade, if not, there might need to be some coordination there to establish some metrics. And by metrics, I mean, for each of the five action areas, What's happening now? What do we want to make further investments in and build out even more? And what might be like our, our kind of aim? If you think like five years from now, we want to have achieved the following kinds of things against each of these action areas. I, that's my expectation. I don't, I, I, there, I, there is a, wor I should say this, there's also a working group that has been uh, drafting um, some monitoring and reporting approaches that will be put forward for member countries to consider as the means by which they do their progress reporting out. And I also think that the other part of this that's sort of implicit is that um, 
for member states that choose to do nothing, um, <laughs> I suppose like in three years, you'll report out that we didn't do anything and mm -hmm. others will be reporting out that we did all this amazing stuff. And so there's a little bit of like the, uh, us is natural, I suppose, uh, different mm -hmm. countries comparing their progress against the recommendation against some other country and wanting to not be left behind and to keep up and to help show that they too are active toward making progress. Um, so I, I think it's, a, that's kind of my take on what's going to happen around this monitoring and reporting. It's a, a little bit early days still, I guess, having just passed this last week to see a lot of rigor around what monitoring and reporting might look like. I also see this as having a relationship with the Open Government Partnership. I don't know if you're aware of that, but this is another kind of area where uh, international governments are agreeing to collaborate around how they use open just mm -hmm. in general. And I can see that this OER recommendation could become a component of how they um, work on their open government partnership initiatives. So I think there's a number of ways this could go, but those are some of the early thoughts from me. I hope that helps. Mm -hmm. can, can I also ask a question just quickly? Of course. <laughs> Thank you so much, Paul, for, for joining us here again. But um, and so you've been also to a lot of research conferences on o OER, and um, one of the things which struck me last the last years is that there was much talk uh, leaving a little bit OER behind and talking more, more about open educational practices. Um, I didn't have a chance to read the entire document. I just uh, Googled quickly through, uh, like searched through the document uh, for the word practice. Um, <laughs> it mentions a lot of, of uh, communities of practice around OER use, yeah. I guess, and producing those is a, a o open educational practice, an OEP, of course. But um, can you say anything from your point of view, how this relates? <laughs> sure. and, yeah, I, I mean, I do think that you'll, if you, when you read the document closely, you'll see that it references the, the importance of rethinking teaching and learning. So, let me, how should I say this? Um, so, so maybe I'll back up just a little bit and then narrow in again to simply say that, you know, we don't, so my organization calls itself open education not open education resources because in my view the umbrella of open education it cuts across teaching and learning research and community service and so when i talk about open education yes of course i talk about open education resources but then i also talk about open practices open pedagogy um, open textbooks MOOCs you know all those fit within that kind of teaching and learning side but on the research side, we have open access research journals and publishing using open means. Uh, we also have open data around ensuring research data is open. And, and uh, increasingly, um, and you heard this actually here in Milano, there's considerably a lot more attention being focused on the third role of higher education, which is around that, you know, support providing community service to society as a whole. And I think actually open is a perfect fit for that. Um, and of course, there's also things like open science and open source software, open source hardware. So these, you know, that's a kind of really big umbrella of open. And this recommendation is like a little slice of it. So to what extent are we also encompassing all these other areas of openness? I think in a limited way would be my answer. Um, but if I was, if I was the Ministry of Education, <laughs> what I would do is, in my monitoring and reporting, I would be conceptualizing how might we embrace open more strategically across all of these dimensions. And then, yes, of course, report out against the specific things that are called for in this recommendation. But I also might report out against um, the extent to which we've gone open access, the extent to which we're uh, embracing and making use of open science and so on, because that represents a larger more strategic um, way in which you're embracing openness, acknowledging OER, yes, but there's a bigger picture at play here. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Further questions also from the, 
broader audience. Everyone knows everything now. <laughs> <laughs> and then maybe uh, just another question by me, because uh, when I read the, the definition of OER, I, uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the very early uh, part of the, of the, uh, the very, very, uh, of the document, there you, you talked about to use OER and material for, for any purpose. I don't know what the, the formulation is in the real paper because I have the German here. Um, and um, you say it should also um, allow to edit uh, the, the material. And uh, in, 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 in German discussions, we have uh, non-commercial and non, no dairy weights uh, uh, licenses. We don't really uh, count them uh, to be OER. Is this uh, a sign that uh, the UNESCO also don't like non-commercial and no dairy Oh, well, they've been very careful not to be that explicit, I think, yeah. uh, because <laughs> this is like a hot topic, right? Um, and having worked at Creative Commons for five years, I can say that those two licenses are, you know, a little bit contentious in the community. Mm. Um, uh, maybe I'll say it like this. I, I think that there's a recommend, if this is a recommendation, don't forget, so, so that you can choose to use those other licenses if you choose. And I think to be fair, I think that sometimes it's appropriate to use, say, like if, if there's an OER on doing heart surgery, I would recommend perhaps it's got no derivatives associated with it because, because that's like a critical piece of knowledge that you don't want changed. Um, but for the most part, I, I'm, I know that the standard practice is to encourage CC BY as the most liberal license. And I would, I, I think of that as the license that perhaps is the one that stimulates the greatest innovation, partly because it is open to commercial use by others. Um, but my personal choice would be CC BY SA and um, the share alike, which which, by the way, is not what Creative Commons says. So that's just Paul Stacey's advice. Is the, I like the share alike because it kind of embraces the idea that this is about sharing. And so any derivative work based on something that I share would, by share alike terms, need to be shared back to the community. So it builds in that particular license, in my view, builds in some of the the community practice part, the social process associated with being open, the notion that anything that is made open and shared, if someone else uses it and changes it, they should share back their changed and improved version so that everyone can benefit, including the original author. Um, so, but I will say that while there's some language in here that sort of recommends the importance of the ability to edit and change the resources, which I think is a natural thing within education. Every teacher and faculty member wants to be able to customize the materials they're using to fit the way they like to teach, their understanding of the domain and so on. So I, I recommend being uh, producing OER that are editable and changeable, um, but it's not by any means mandated. Okay, if there are oh. no more questions by the yes, audience. Oh, sorry, Kerstin. I've got one, uh, one other question um, to get the chance uh, to look in the process of, uh, of the voting process. If you like to talk about these, yes, these, the years, if the people talk about the, the sentences and the wordings, um, I have to, or oh, my question is, where's the, where are the points and it's uh, with the view on OEP uh, that, that made the broad consensus, consensus, like this paper now, but where are the critical points? The people, you, you have the feeling we have uh, further discussing about it because the people are, uh, or there's need further discussion the next years. And um, this point could be points in the one next paper or a revision of the paper. Um, so what's, <laughs> what can I say? I'll say, I'll say it this way. Um, 
the opportunity for input and making suggestions for changes mm -hmm. and edits and and um, and additions has been underway now for years and mm -hmm. so that that process has been very open and anyone has had a chance your governments have all had a chance and even your practitioners and civil societies have all had a chance to provide input and suggestions for uh, what this recommendation should say and um, and what has happened as a result of that is that you now have a document that you know the 193 or 94 member states have all said yes okay. this is good thumbs up from us right and yeah. so the opportunity but i would say that now that that's happened this is a fixed document i don't expect there to be a you know a, a recommendation version two I don't think so. Um, there hardly are ever any recommendations adopted or developed by UNESCO. It's a it's a very unusual for this to have happened at all. And so there could be the way I think of it is there could be another recommendation that might get developed eventually that might have may may say more about open education practices or this this bigger context that I just described around the importance mm -hmm. of embracing open. Um, I, I think that there's potentially something that could be done to link this recommendation, the OER recommendation, to the sustainable development goals that also have been mm -hmm. published by UNESCO, particular SDG4, mm -hmm. which has to do with quality of education. Um, but but I think that the opportunity for people to make suggestions for changes in addition to this document are over. That's over, and that whole process is done. So now we're now we have what we have. <laughs> I think it's pretty good, actually. I'm no, I'm, I'm not dissatisfied great. with it, but I, yeah. but I think that's now it's time to work with what we've been given. Yes, I think it's a very great paper and a very broad uh, mm. paper. Um, what I about thought uh, was, was the question: if there are some unacceptable points every country had said okay here's it's a front or a barrier for for us that's that couldn't be a consent in our state or culture so yes uh, so there were the, there were lots of those i would say yeah. <laughs> um and so uh like i witnessed a bunch of those at the last uh at the not last week's convening by unesco but the one that happened back in the spring I was there for that. And so, of course, you know, as, as the recommendation got read line by line and clause by clause, various countries would say, actually, the way that's worded doesn't work <laughs> for me. Um, and uh, I, and then it would be, what would happen in that context is that they would be asked to make a recommendation. If you don't like the way it's worded, what is your proposed mm -hmm. revision? And then that would be discussed and, mm -hmm. Usually, I would say most of the time, uh, that was agreeable and consensus was reached. Sometimes, though, it was very problematic. Uh, certain countries, should I name names? So it's a countries, no, no. not, um, you know, would have particular sticking points. And then a small working group would be held amongst the, mm -hmm. the group that had, you know, what issues, and they would be asked to go out and resolve them and come back with a recommendation for how to move forward. Um, I think in my, my experience of that was that the way that they often resolved those was by looking at other instruments that UNESCO has developed among all of its member states and adopting phrasing and terms that were adopted and successful in those other things and then moving them into this document, into this recommendation mm -hmm. as a way of reaching consensus. I actually think, you know, when you read through it, it's, you know, it's fairly carefully written in a way mm -hmm. that is kind yeah. of not, not, not offensive to any particular no. <laughs> cultural belief. And so I think, I think, a, I think it did a pretty good job of, of, in, of being inclusive and, and sensitive to those kinds of, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yes, an interesting and fascinating process. It's super hard actually to get consensus as opposed to just like majority voting. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, now so so maybe you can can you can you talk a little bit about the the points where uh, you 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 discussed a little bit about and at the end you said okay that does not uh, do not do not uh, take them into the document or are they so high. 
uh, high critical that you say, oh no, that was, <laughs> I would, would hurt someone if I, I, I revealed which points are very unsure here. I think we should we'll just forget about that. Just let it go. <laughs> I'm, I, I think it's better not to dwell on what those were um, and, to, and to literally now, you know, not reflect on the past, but look at what it says and it's been adopted. And now the next step is really around how are we going to implement what it calls for? And I think that's a big, that's a big undertaking. There are lots of countries and maybe some of them represented on this webinar who have not done much of anything with regard to open education and open education resources. And now they have, they've agreed to do something. And so how do we begin to work with our, our countries and our governments and our stakeholders around this to, to build some momentum around making some forward uh, progress around what the recommendation calls for. I think that's really the thing to focus on now. If we have a beer, I can talk about those other things. Yeah. <laughs> Talking about moving onwards and towards this end. <laughs> Like it, I know in Ger in Sweden, uh, in Germany, obviously they the UNESCO um, Commission in Germany already translated the document, seem very proactive or like uh, active on this um, towards this end. I looked in now simultaneously in, on the German and the Swedish version. There was nothing mentioned on Twitter. Nothing. They had maybe their own agenda and were very happy with what they were working for during the. UNESCO conference, um, you, would you have any suggestions how we could approach or what we could do in Sweden or I don't know what the state in Finland is. Um, in Germany, we learned last webinar, there's many fundings for OER in, in Sweden, not so much. <laughs> um, so, so um, general tips? Uh, well, a couple of comments would be um, I, I appreciate the importance of having the OER recommendation available in multiple languages because, you know, everyone wants to read exactly what it says in their own language. And I believe, and I'm not 100% familiar with this process, but I believe that UNESCO itself is engaged in a translation process and that there will be released, not sure when, but let's say this coming spring, uh, official translated versions of the recommendation. I'm not sure in how many languages UNESCO officially does that for, um, but if, so one obvious step would be to do a unofficial translated version of what the recommendation says, just so that you have it in the local language such that people can understand the basics of it. And then I think that's a, a great place to start just to get uh, to raise uh, some so raise some general awareness about what it's calling for, uh, without saying that it's the official version. Official version still to to arrive sometime later, uh, but nonetheless, I think that um, what I see as next steps would sort is sort of contextualized based on where you are and who you are. So, um, if you're a faculty member in your university, I would be ask I would be talking to my colleagues and my deans and my head of academics around, do you know UNESCO just adopted an OER recommendation and it, it talks about all these things, what, what, what are we as an institution going to do um, now that our government has essentially approved and accepted this and, and is calling for its adoption in our country? If you're at the government level, I think that it's another level of discussion because the UNESCO instrument was something that's been approved now by the government. And so how will the government operate differently based on this recommendation? And the differences could, could be very small, depends on how big they wanna go, or could be very comprehensive. And um, so I would, you know, if I, was you can start wherever you are, whatever level you're at, at the grassroots level or a higher leadership level, I think there are opportunities for uh, both dialogue and now uh, calls for action from our stakeholders to initiate some uh, activities, some funding, some strategies, some planning 
uh, around this recommendation uh, such that when it comes time for monitoring reporting, your country's actually done something, <laughs> isn't going to be ashamed or embarrassed by, by not having done anything. Um, I, I, the way, so maybe I'll just say a few words about the little mini coalition that I formed because um, you know, my organization is Open Education Global, so we have members all around the world, and so does Creative Commons, another partner of ours, and so does Commonwealth of Learning, and so does the International Council for Open and Distance Education. And so by joining forces, what we were thinking of doing, we haven't actually even met yet, but the current concept is each of us would say, for this action area, we already have the following resources that countries or institutions or ministries could use to help develop a strategy or plan or, or an actual uh, formal implementation of any of those five action areas. But where do we have gaps, right? What's missing in terms of helping support the implementation of the recommendation? And now if there are gaps, how might we spread the development of resources and services to fill those gaps across our collective, our coalition, instead of each of us replicating um, that kind of work? And then uh, I think the other topic of conversation is how will we provide resources and services to support governments and institutions and schools and educators in using the recommendation and creating real traction around it? Um, because uh, if I look at my, you know, my global members, there's lots of them. And, but some of them are very far along with doing open education and others are just starting. And I feel that the ones who are just starting in particular need some, they need some help, right? And, and how can we create um, not, another, not another government document, but some real practical on the ground sort of structured ways of thinking about we can move forward with implementation in the following ways. And so, uh, that that's sort of an attempt on my side to create a coalition that would be more focused on providing practical on the ground support for implementation, either at the grassroots level or at the leadership senior level. Both levels are important. Ideally, you want bottom up and, and top down happening at the same time. Excellent. Lots to do. There's so much to do. This isn't going to be quick, right? This is going to take years. and and. But I do love the way the recommendation is essentially a call for action. And uh, I do really hope that we see some uh, intersection with the SDG four, uh, because if I look at the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, they have a due date or their expected completion is like 2030. So I would be saying, I would be looking at this, I would be, you should vote for Paul and he will. <laughs> uh, but I would be looking at how, do the, how does the OER recommendation help us fulfill uh, SDG 4, quality of education for all? And, um, and what might we, if I was to be strategically creating a long-term plan, I would have a 10-year plan from 2020 to 2030. We're going to do the following things. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you. And as Gabi uh, mentioned in the, in the chat, uh, that the translation from, uh, into the German version was enabled by uh, German volunteers who supported the UNESCO Commission. And then I'm not sure if it's already an official UNESCO uh, checked uh, version, German translated version, but it helped me very much uh, to, to understand also for uh, and to read it very, very quickly. And I guess it could be also possible for Finnish and Swedish. Uh, okay, it's an official version already. Wow, uh, for the Finnish and Swedish uh, um, languages. So, um, Paul, do you know if there are further actions by the UNESCO to monitor these recommendation um, um, to to, to um, networks and communities and actions that maybe rely on the on the recommendation or, or that are already uh, started and, and meet the recommendation or do you think there would be um, it need more the, the, the countries that uh, that should monitor their own 
Um, well, I, so I'll say this. I, I think that it is really based on what countries want to do. Mm. Um, but I, I also know that in the background, there is work being done on um, s- some recommendations around how to monitor um, mm. and how to think about reporting out on progress. Um, I know, but I also know that it hasn't been released yet. And I'm not sure when the release of that will happen. Um, but it's been underway for quite a while. So it's uh, actually... Um, yeah, so I expect it will come out this coming year, but again, it will be not a mandated way of thinking about it, but um, a tool that could be used to design your own monitoring and reporting program. And then I think uh, the other thing, and again, I'm not 100% sure of this because I haven't actually heard specifically how m- my understanding from the meeting in the spring was that they were thinking that reporting out would happen every three years. So you have sort of a three-year runway here to kind of make some progress and then you'd report out and then be another three years and so on. Uh, but I, I'm not, it's uh, the actual time frame for reporting out is defined at the general conference that just happened last week. Um, and I haven't seen the details around what the reporting out cycle of time is expected to be. Oh, that's just because I've been busy running a conference and haven't uh, done the background. Oh, interesting. Okay, from looking at the time, we are coming to to an end. It's the group work uh, was, uh, I think we, we, we skip uh, this uh, and we <laughs> took the, uh, the very, very chance to, to ask you some questions. So I want to hand over to the uh, to the participants, if there is any question, you can, it's a la- maybe one of the last chances this year <laughs> to ask Paul. <laughs> right. Mm. Okay, no one is... Can I ask in the chat room or activate your microphone or unmute it? Hmm. We covered it all. Oh, yeah. everyone understands everything. I like it. <laughs> All crystal clear. <laughs> yes. And uh, just a lot of work ahead. But uh, I was say this is really encouraging and uh, gives me in the Swedish context a lot of energy to uh, continue yeah. working with this, I must say. Um, now that we have this recommendation in the back end, like as a, as in hopefully as an engine to continue and um, yeah, raise awareness of, of, the, of the concept in the Swedish context for OER. Yeah. In the school sector, K-12, it's, it, I think it's more common, but higher education. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly yeah. But now we can all connect on Twitter as well, I guess, um, and uh, keep on uh, the communication uh, uh, there. Thanks for having your Twitter handle there in your name. I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I do think that really in the short term, the next activity in my view is all around awareness raising, uh, you know, that this has even happened. It's not something you see featured on the news, right? Um, So how do we raise awareness about it and start to generate dialogue in our own environments or countries? That's really the big thing. You know, I'm working on a press release together with our communications department uh, from our university and um, hope it will not be the only news um, around this in Sweden. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's always a delight to meet others from around the world and talk about these, these uh, efforts to advance open education. It's been a real pleasure. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, therefore we also thank to OER Info, uh, especially to Gabi who gave us the, um, the platform for, for having the exchange with these very interesting countries. Um, yeah, I want to say thank you uh, and thank you to, to also to Jörg and to Ilmarie who uh, uh, raised up this webinar series uh, with, uh, with Gabi and me and also to Anna, sorry, <laughs> won't, won't miss you. Uh, yeah, I guess we are at the point where we have to say goodbye and have a nice uh, Christmas time and then we maybe see you next year at some OER conferences and in other contexts. Yeah.
Thank you very much. Awesome, Thank you. Thank you all. See you. Bye. 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 Thank you.